today. The shortlist was announced for the FIFA Player of the Year. Cristiano Ronaldo, Mohamed Salah and Luka Modric are making up those three nominations. Before, gentlemen, I get to who you think should win the whole award, is this the right top three for the last year? Craig. Look, as soon as I saw this this morning, it wasn't difficult to know where we were going and the obvious thing is Messi. Yes. I don't have his stats in front of me, <clears> so, but I'd imagine it's a hell of a lot, a lot of goals. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, the answer is probably. Oh, look! <laughs> this is, uh... I, you know, we had this discussion about, what was the award last week? Uh, that was the uh, UEFA, UEFA Player of the, the Year. Yes. We, had, we had a discussion about how Modric, how everything's not about stats, right? Because Luka Modric does lots of other things in games apart from score goals. And, but but and, it is about and, trophies, isn't it? Well, that's a team event. Yes. Well, this is not a team award. No, no but surely trophies should be considered in the fact that Messi won La Liga, he won the Copa del Rey, Salah, for example, won nothing. But that's a team event. This right. goes back to the Messi winning the World Cup sort of thing with yeah. Argentina. He can't, he can't carry all the other players in his back. All the, maybe, maybe some will say Maradona did it. But I, I, to be honest, he's not on it, right? And I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Sure. So I saw the list and I was like, OK, fine. OK. Um, should he be on it, in yes. your opinion? Yes. <clears throat> Is Lionel <clears throat> Messi one of the three best players in the world? Yes. So he should be on the list. And not because we just think he's one of the three best players in the world or arguably the best player in the world. It's just because the productivity that he had with Barcelona over the course of last season deserved as much. Not only was he scoring the goals, but as you say, he was winning trophies as well. So <clears> yes, he belongs on the list. Whether he wins it or not, I don't know. But he should be in the finalist. In place of? Well, you just said it, Mohamed Salah. Mohamed Salah had a tremendous season. Tremendous season. A, a fantastic season. Historic, if you will. But I don't think it was better than Messi's. Stevie? I can't agree more with the boys. Um, you know, Lionel Messi should be there. Uh, and yes, it should be over Salah. I, I, there has to be some sort of way of separating it all because somebody has to win it. And yeah. we have to come up, or they have to come up with a reason to separate it. And I have no problem separating it by saying who actually won trophies. Yeah. Because if, if we're but just going to... But that's a team event then. But we're just going to try... How, how do you equate who's been better than the next guy? If, I mean, if, it, if you put what? it down to goals, that means that centre-backs well, the one have thing... got no chance. Yeah. If, Look, Romelu Lukaku scored a thousand goals for Everton last year. Why did he not win it? Now, Everton's never going to win a thing. So, listen, it's, it's really hard to come up with reasons to separate all these guys. They're so good. The one there has to be something. And, I, and personally, I think trophies, trophies won, whether you, you think it's a team event or not, that's, that would be my separation. So I, I, see, I, this is where it for. It's either a team of it's either a team or an individual. An individual can't control the team, but he can control his own performances. <clears throat> One thing I would say about Mo Salah, but on the list, you expect Ronaldo to be covering himself in glory. You expect Messi to be doing the same, although he's not on it. You expect Luka Modric to be playing to the standard he's been playing for probably, you know, five or six years now at least. But we didn't expect Mo Salah to turn those numbers in. Sure, we just didn't. So, in terms of exceeding expectations, Mo Salah has exceeded the expectations last season by, by, by miles, by absolute miles. Well, the rest the, of them give him the newcomer of the year award. Sorry? Give him the newcomer of the year award. Yeah, but you, you, can, you can punish <laughs> Lionel Messi because he's been consistent over the course of his career mm. then. Well, who's punishing him? Who's making these decisions? I have not got a clue. <laughs> I, 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 I have not. It's a mix between fans, <clears throat> votes, coaches, players, isn't it? Well, there you go. That's what happens when you get idiots involved. <laughs> That's what happens. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> which, part of the, which groups are the idiots? <laughs> uh, let's bring uh, Mark Ogden into the conversation. Mark, who's your top three? Do you agree with the three that were announced today? Um, I agree with the lads that maybe, maybe Mo Salah's quite lucky to get in there on the basis that he had a great season, but Liverpool didn't win anything. I, think, I, I do think you have to lift your team to a trophy to kind of qualify for this. So Messi won La Liga, Ronaldo won the Champions League and, and Modric played a part in that as well, the Champions League win. But if, if you're looking for a player that I'd, I'd put in there that lifted his team, club and country, to, to greater things, I'd say Antoine Griezmann. I, I, did they have a better season than Salah? Maybe not individually, but in terms of a team, Atletico Madrid won the Europa League, they qualified quite easily for the Champions League and obviously France won the World Cup and he played a big part in that. So. I'd say Griezmann ahead of Salah in a, in a top three with Modric, Ronaldo and Griezmann. Despite that 2-0 victory at Turf Moor against Burnley, Jose Mourinho still the uh, favourite, according to the bookies, to be the first manager to leave. 
uh, Premier League club this season. Mark, you take a look at it though. Surely that win has certainly quieted things down a little bit. Yeah, I think I don't think there's anybody at Man United who wants to sack Jose Mourinho. I think certainly the board. I think they're quite keen for this kind of upheaval to go away and, and for everything to calm down a little bit. And I think yesterday's result at, at Burnley was a big one in, in the sense that it ended the losing run. There's nobody out there to replace Mourinho here and now. People talk about Zidane, but is Zidane a great manager or is he a great manager of big egos and great talent at Real Madrid? So I think what United want is to calm down and, and just back Mourinho to, to turn the corner. So this one at Burnley was a big one because it just banished the crisis talk. If they'd have lost yesterday, going into an international break with Watford away next, it would have been, it would have been difficult to bear for a few days. But nobody you know, wants, wants this upheaval anymore. So I think... It, it is a big result, and I think that if they can get results at Watford, it will, it will steady things down. But they are in danger of being cast adrift in the top four a little bit, because obviously Liverpool have started so well, Chelsea yeah. have started surprisingly well, Tottenham have done OK, City have started well, so it's going to be difficult for United. They're playing catch-up already for the top four. I think, let's be honest, they're not going to win the title. Top four is all that matters in terms of getting in the Champions League, and they have given themselves a bit of work to do in terms of keeping pace, so they have to build on that win at Burnley. Otherwise, this kind of crisis top will just be around the corner for weeks and weeks. United fans think that Ed Woodward, the executive vice chairman, isn't backing Mourinho in the market, despite the fact Mourinho spent an awful lot of money over the last two years on, on players that he wanted. But Woodward's an easy target, and the thing is, what people maybe don't realise is that he's the safest person at Old Trafford. He, you know, he's the guy that advised the Glazers on the takeover back in 2005. He worked for JP Morgan. He was a banker at the time, and they brought him on board because they were so impressed by the work he did that they made sure he had a job at Old Trafford. His job was to boost the commercial income and to make loads of money. He does that. I just think he's got too many things on his plate. He, he, he covers every aspect and he hasn't quite surrendered the, the transfer kit yet. So I think the United fans have, taken, have turned to him because they don't want to turn to Mourinho because at least Mourinho has a proven track record of winning things, even though it may be two or three years ago and he keeps titles that he won three Premier League titles. It is in the past. You know, he got rid of Wayne Rooney, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Bastian Schweinsteiger because they're best age in the past. So. You know, Mourinho can't have it both ways, but he has got a proven track record, and I think the fans believe that if anyone can turn them round, it'll be him rather than Ed Woodward. But I just think it's a sort of noise you get when the team isn't playing well. If they win the next couple of games, it'll all, be, it'll all disappear and everyone will forget about it. What the hell is it with these managers? If I was a player now in that Tottenham team, and I've just started the season with three straight wins, including a 3 0 win away at Old Trafford, and five days later I'm sitting on the bench and we're not even playing the same shape and we lose. I'll be banging my head against the wall because as a player, and I know you need a rest at some point during the season, but not four games in whether you've played at a World Cup or not. So I don't get it with Pochettino. I've seen him do it before. It is something he does. He changes the wing-backs, he changes the centre-backs, he changes the midfielders. The only one that plays most of the time is Harry Kane. But I just don't understand his need to change the team. Mark, he was pretty scathing, wasn't he, of his players after the game, questioning some of their character and their winning mentality. Well, lack of it... But surely it's kind of down to him, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, Craig's right. We do see this you know, every now and again with Tottenham that they, they reach the heights and all of a sudden they fall flat again. And, you know, they've got Liverpool at home after the international break. And again, you don't know which Tottenham will turn up. Will it be the one that lost at Watford or will it be the one that beat Liverpool 4 1 last season at Wembley? On the day, they can beat anybody in the, in the Premier League, but they do look a little bit. They still look like they, look, they lack experience and a bit of a bit of now. So a bit of, you know, somebody when, when the game's going against them is to put the. You know, just to control it a bit and put the foot on the ball and just, just, just coach them through it a little bit. And I, I think Pochettino doesn't like or doesn't seem to have these players in his team. He, you know, he's up and down with Alderweireld, one of his better players, and he does like younger players. But the problem with younger players in the team is that they sometimes look for direction amongst the teammates on the pitch. And I don't think Tottenham have got that. They haven't got that player in the set. They haven't got a Vincent Company or a Kevin De Bruyne or you know even an Angolo Kante or a Gary Cahill, somebody that's been there and done it and that can say, just listen, lads, just calm in there for ten minutes. Let's get the tempo of the game back again. And Spurs just seem to lack that. They've got the great talent, but they just look like a team that needs an older head in the middle of the, in the middle of the team at defence and midfield, just can just guide them through these tough games. Can you can you tell me what part does Pochettino not get? He comes. He's got the cheek at the end of the game to come in and question their attitude. <laughs> As soon as he gives them the team, you know there's three or four going, oh, hold on a minute, this must be an easy game. He's changing the system. He's changing a winning team. We've got some of the players that should be playing that are not playing. He already, before the ball's kicked, has sent a message that this is an easier game than what we got last week against Man United. So don't ever go at the players.
Been a great start for Liverpool, hasn't it? But take a look at these fixtures after the international break. Boy, it's going to be testing for Jurgen Klopp's side. Mark, you've been writing about this over on the website. Uh, what in particular strikes you from this list, apart from it's very, very difficult? It is difficult, and it's difficult in the Champions League as well. They've got PSG and Napoli, so they've got a real tough run of games domestically. You know, it's in the next six weeks, like you say, Tottenham, Chelsea, Man City. They've got Chelsea twice. It's just a really, really draining four or five weeks for Jurgen Klopp's team and also he's going to have to rotate his squad a little bit and that will test their resources and it, he really needs to, to win something this year and the, the League Cup is, is probably the easiest to win but Chelsea at home, the way Chelsea have started this season, you know, they could be out again in the third round so it's a big month and I think if they, if they do get knocked out of the League Cup it's going to strike a blow to their morale in the sense that that's one trophy gone. So this for me is the month which showed us what Liverpool are made of. If they come through this month unbeaten in the Premier League, then I think you can take them seriously as potential title winners. But one thing I did say in that, in that piece was that the one unique problem that Liverpool have got when in this title race is that if they get past Christmas in the, in the first or second, the emotion and the desperation of Liverpool fans to win the league, we saw it in, in 2014 when they came so close, it, it can get so intense and it can be quite suffocating to a certain extent that the, the, the kind of expectancy and the desire to win something. So I do think that Liverpool are going to have to manage that this year. They're going to have to manage that kind of special pressure to win the, the Premier League because it's been so long. I mean, I think, I think Steve was playing the last time they won it. You were, Steve, weren't you? I was, I. My God. I was expecting a reaction from you. No, from... Do you know, I was thinking about what Mark was saying there. I, I remember Manchester United. Uh, I think it would be 1990. <clears throat> and they hadn't won it either for some 20-odd years. Mm. And I remember them coming to Anfield... And you could see the tension on Fergie's face. Right. Uh, and there's no question when the manager's like that, that, that goes on to the players as well. So, you know, if, if come next year and the, and then in the final stretch, let's see what, what Jurgen Klopp's like. Is he still going to be this happy, smiling chappy who, who doesn't have a care in the world or is he going to feel the pressure? Because if Fergie was feeling it, well, he's, he's been feeling over, it. He's been over the line. Anybody's going to feel he's it. He's been over the line before. Mm with Dortmund mm. in Germany against the mighty Bayern Munich. So he has been over the line. Uh, you talk about Man United, do you remember, was it 94 the first? I can't remember when they first won the league uh, under Fergie. You probably know better than me, Mark. It was early 90s. but you, you know, 93, yeah. 93, was that when Bruce scored that header against mm. Sheffield Wednesday? Sheffield. I mean, it's like, it just even for those players, those guys have been around the Premier League and top yeah. flight football for years. But, but you must have had it, when obviously, when you, you saw Rangers winning, what, 10 in a row when you were at Celtic? Yeah, no, but all that pressure all, is yeah, evident it's every week. Yeah. It's a slightly different standard, but I mean, Rangers were a very good side then with Gascoigne and Loudrup and, and McCoy's. The, le the list goes on, and Scottish football was different then. But that went down to the last game of the season, and it did. I mean, training that week, training that week was a shambles. We actually, we trained for about 20 minutes one day, I think it was the Tuesday, and Vim Jansen, the coach, just stopped the session. Because everybody was arguing with each other and fighting right. and, and kicking, and it was horrible because everybody was so tense. And so he just said, stop, say tomorrow. Right. So it's who's going to handle it the most. But listen, if you look at their bench now, the one thing they've done, when you looked at Liverpool bench last year, it was a little bit thin. But when you look at the bench now, when, every, when everybody's fit and hopefully they keep people fit, he's got a few choices to, to pick from. So that's the one upside for him. Can I just say, you'd rather have that tension, though. Yeah. You'd rather have yeah. that opportunity. And, mm -hmm. and then you'll see how you handle it then. But you want to get to the end with a chance. And if that's the case, then Liverpool is, will be very much into it. And I think they'll be ready to go. He's not as tense as Napoli chairman. Uh, no. <laughs> We've seen him crying about Liverpool winning <laughs> point three. Uh, to Lorenz is uh, loves a cry about anything, though. Oh, my he? God. Steve Nicol was given sole responsibility of choosing Ooh. the team of the weekend. Stevie, take us through it. I think I'll start at the top. Dini and Lukaku. I mean... Lukaku? If you're looking for style, you ain't getting it from any of these two, but absolute match winners. Troy Dini, no question, the leader of the pack for Watford. Uh, middle of the park, Sterling and Traore, pace and goals wide. Hoiberg and Moutinho, I mean, talk about organised and Hoiberg throws a goal in as well. Cody and Kafka, not the most obvious again, um, but Cody has been fantastic for Wilson since he started. And Kafka's goal for Watford was uh, superb along with his defensive play. And Walker and Shaw, well, you talk about attacking fullbacks. And of course, what a goal from Walker. And in goal, Dubravka. Newcastle may have lost, but I'll tell you what, it would have been a cricket score had that guy really? not been in goals. Is uh, someone who's considered two goals in the team of the week? But it could have been ten. <laughs> He's still lost. 
All right, name me a, name me a goalkeeper this weekend that was better than him. Well, who kept clean sheet? De Gea, put him in. Well, he's playing against Burnley. <laughs> <laughs> I right. could have, they, could, they could have had me in goals against Burnley, by the way. How hard? That was a kind of threat. How hard was it for you to put Lukaku up there? Uh, I did have to think about it. <laughs> but in the end, I'm a very fair and generous person, as you know. Well. And he deserved to be in it. It was an important game. And he scored two goals. No, he could have got five. Hey, there he is. There it is. There it is. He could have got five, but he got two. And two is it's better than none. It's better than none. Not as good as five. It's better than one as well. Welcome into Extra Time. Let's get straight to it. It's a personal question to start with for you, Craig. Or for me. How's the daily run? Huh? Hey. We'll run I think this, this is uh, your exercise routine. But you never really ran, hey. did you? you no, the old, daily run. On the, I haven't ran for years. You went on the uh, cross trainer, the elliptical thing? <laughs> did I? What's that? What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I went on the... Uh... <laughs> That's not for me. Sorry? How do you know that's from me? Because it says at C Burley ESPN. Well, not on the tweet, it doesn't. Well, on my bit of thing, it does. Well, that's, I'm going by this one. <laughs> uh, that I wasn't running. I'm going to guess there's not one of us sat here, including you, that runs. I run. Ali runs? I run. What? Ali yeah. runs a lot. He never ran when he was playing. What are you running there for? Is, what, did you just set up a joke or? No. <laughs> well, what he does is he, run, he runs 50 yards and he falls over. He gets up, runs 50 yards, falls over. But that's running. <laughs> now, what's the machine that's not the elliptical, as you say? It's the one without the arms, just the legs. Right. <laughs> what is going so on? So good. It's changed from that to that. I don't know what the name it's of it is. Just the legs. Oh. That's what I did. How's it going anyway? I've stopped in the summer. Oh. I stopped golf at the moment. When the golf finishes and the winter comes, I'll start again. Right. So I'm, I'm having a sabbatical. Controversy. <laughs> How about you, sir? No. <laughs> well, no, Steve, 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 Steve is different. Oh. He's got a bike at home. <laughs> and he you gets... have a bike at home, yeah? Oh, I've got a bike at home, I. How much use does it get? Oh, it's still a lot of cobwebs on it. <laughs> Has it got the washing on it? It's got a lot. <laughs> It's got everything on it except me. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. What do you make of Nemanja Matic's comment that Jose Mourinho's media antics is good for Manchester United? Oh, what a lot. He said it was like a scream, wasn't Absolute it? Absolutely. Everyone's talking about him and not the yeah. players. Yeah, let's make the world jump on us at every turn and bring everybody against us. That's a great strategy, that, isn't it? Mm. It's, how's it working for them? Maybe Burnley. Well, there you go. If that's what you can do, then good. It's a weird way to look at it because that's like saying, oh, the manager's getting all the heat, so nobody's noticed we got pasted by Tottenham for <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's in the street <laughs> going, hey! <laughs> Great result, boy! I wonder what was, I forgot the result, but you... It's one thing if, <laughs> if the manager's taking all the pressure and, and that's it, but he's taking some of that pressure and creating some uh, pressure on the players as well. Yeah. That's what he used to do. Yeah. He used to be a genius at that. The team weren't doing well, mm. oh, everyone was at home and it took the pressure off them. Now he's going like that, hold on a minute, why am I getting all this stuff here? Yeah. Take some of that. Yeah. Captain Deflecto. What, what yeah. are you like in the press, of, a press conference when you're oh. the coach? Tell them nothing. I told you. <laughs> Don't answer the questions. Listen to the question, and then tell them what you want them and to know. Then what if you ask someone like me asking you the question again because I want the I'll right answer? Keep, I'll just keep giving you the, the <laughs> rhetoric. Doing this merry dance Absolutely, today. Absolutely, aren't I? Do you hate the media? <laughs> Do you realise you work in it? <laughs> well, <laughs> there was some of them get, would get up my beak, I. Really? Yeah, when they ask stupid questions. What, like? Is this <laughs> yeah, what's the stupidest question? Is this his Facebook know. friend again? Many, too many to remember. <laughs> oh, you mean like... <laughs> uh, do you know the worst? I'll tell you what the worst. The worst was somebody would throw a hypothetical at you. Right. So you've just won a game, 2-1, you've scored in the, the, like two minutes to go or whatever, and somebody go, can you just, you know, if you hadn't scored and only drawn the game, you yes. know, would you... Well, what, <laughs> we did score and we did win the game. What do you want me to tell you? Well, that's just a shut up, isn't it? Well, it's just not. That's just a straight shut up. That's a classic stupid answer, uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> Who's had the most surprising start to the season? Manchester United, West Ham, or Watford? Mm. United aren't really in that, are they? I think it's West Ham or Watford. Mm. Mm. I really do think that West Ham were going to be better than what they have been. Yeah, that's some kind yeah. of awful. But I, Watford right now, top of the league, yeah. Have West Ham played anyone yet? Who's what? Yeah. Who's what? Wait, they beat Spurs. Yes. Who did, who did they beat before that? 
Brighton. Brighton. Oh, yeah. Are you making faces over there? I'm trying. Don't look at me, I'm on the cross trainer. Yeah, so, the, so what? Aye. So it's West Ham. West Ham. Oh my goodness. They're, they're horrible. What a shot. That's been how bad they are. They are bad. Oof. Oof. Horrible team. We've got a good manager actually who's probably thinking, what the hell have I done? They've got a bad structure upstairs. People talk about the stadium. It's, uh, but at the end of the day, they're just a horrible team. Yeah. Stadium's not a great stadium to go and watch football, but that's not, doesn't make them a horrible team. Put Man City in that stadium or Liverpool, yeah. they play all right. Crystal Palace and Burnley, apparently. What for the beating as well. Right. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's not going to last. Yeah. I suppose it's a great victory, but I mean, it's not. It wasn't beyond the realms of possibility, was it, before the season kicked off, that they could win those games. Elton John was in the stands. You like Elton John? Elton John? Yeah, he's not bad. You seen him live? I have, I. What was he like? He was not bad. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> He got be he got better as the evening went on. <laughs> Is that because he got better? No, or, no, or no, you? Because I was getting more than didn't it. <laughs> yeah. Rocket man, uh, Rooney? Question mark. Where's Seb when you need him? Eh? Oh no. I wonder if Seb sits at home and he's openly rooting against DC United so that he doesn't have to answer this question. Did he say he was going to be... Uh... He said he didn't want oh, him, he said it was ridiculous. I mean, he lost it. Well, mm. you know, he loses it yeah. quite often. But... It just it didn't fit the demographic. Yes, that too. That was, his, that was his main problem. And we were not allowed to talk about it because we, we don't live in DC. Forget the guy's fantastic on the field. That doesn't matter. As long as you fit the demographic, that's all it matters. Oh yeah, because it was really important. It was people walking right by the, in the droves around DC going, Bloody Rooney, it be a disaster for this city. <laughs> exactly. Bloody Rooney. Uh, that is it. We are done. We return tomorrow, International Week, of He's course. doing well, Rooney, though, I'll tell you. What? Yeah, he's doing well indeed. Um, that's it. We're back. That's it? Oh, well, yeah, I think so. Okay. I think we're, we're golfing tomorrow. We are indeed, Alan. <laughs> no, you're, you're golfing. <laughs> He's doing what? I don't know what he'll be doing. <laughs> Getting angry. <laughs> silent, you mean? You go silent. The US squad has been announced for the upcoming friendlies against Brazil and Mexico. A 25-man strong squad from Dave Sarakin as he looks to try and blood a few more youngsters against top-class opposition. DeAndre Yedlin is in there, fresh from scoring in the Premier League with Newcastle as well. There's no Christian Pulisic due to injury. But Ali, as we take a look at the names that are here, any surprises for you? No, I don't think these are surprises. I, I just think that's the trend and that's the plan going forward is we're going to look at young players, an average age of 23 for this group of players. And what you find from Dave Sarakin is essentially saying, look, I, I know what Josie Alter looks like and I know what he does in the field. I know what Michael Bradley does in the field and that sort of player. So what we need to take a look at is the next generation, the guys that are going to carry this team forward onto the next World Cup. And possibly onto the future and when you evaluate these players then no better place to do it than against teams like Brazil because of the history and what Brazil means in the world of football and Mexico because it's your rival and so you're gonna get to see the reaction of young players in an event and in a, on the field in a moment that doesn't count and yet it does push you it does push the the player to to provide his very best and you want to see that reaction. Say, is, is this young player ready to take on Brazil? Is this young player ready to take on a big rival in Mexico? There are no friendlies against Mexico. So in that sort of pressure, in that sort of environment, I want to see how he behaves. Is he able to take the ball down, show some character, show some personality, and do the things that make him a successful player? That evaluation process is going on in training session. This is going on once the game starts. And it's also going on in the behavior of the players during the, the national team call-up. Everything counts when you are the national team, and when you're a young player, you can't just take these opportunities for granted. These are moments in which you've got to showcase what you are, and then maybe that warrants a second call-up. The other thing is that Dave Serkin is evaluating players, and yet the overarching feeling is that he's not going to be around. So who is he evaluating players for? 
doesn't seem to be for himself. So at some point, this federation has to make a decision as to who the next manager of this national team is going to be so that then the evaluation that takes place in this game has some importance and has some value. At what point does that have to happen for you? Because, of course, we've got the domestic friendlies now, mm. and into October, the South American teams, they'll be up against them, mm. and then the European sides will actually take the team away from home. Does there need to be a transition into the head coach role at that point? Or because the, the next major landmark isn't until the Gold Cup next summer, we've got plenty of time, and this is a really healthy process that they're going through, no matter whether there's a permanent head coach in place or not. Uh, yes, uh, I understand that there's plenty of time, but... When you say plenty of time, it, it, doesn't, uh, it ac doesn't actually mean plenty of games. Uh, it's just plenty of time in, in, in terms of months, but it's not plenty of time in terms of the actual amount of times that you see the players out on the field performing and competing at the national team level. And so you're going to have limited repetition. And it, it would be my estimation that they would, they would be better off having a coach in place that takes this process of evaluating the young players, takes it right from the beginning, right from the start, so that, okay, this new guy comes in, and now we're going we're gonna to go back to square one? Is that how it's going to work? Or is he going to trust the evaluation of Dave Serkin and his staff and the evaluation of, of somebody else, the technical director? Or is he, is, is he the sort of manager that comes in and says, no, no, no I, I need to see this myself. I'm the one making the decision. The pressure is on me. It's my name behind this team. And so I want to see what these guys look like under my process, under my staff, under my evaluation, under my training sessions. And so the sooner they do that, I think the better for the national team. However, it doesn't mean that you have to make the wrong choice simply because you're making a quick choice. Take your time, but make sure that once you make that decision, you commit to it and make sure that that guy is now evaluating the young players. Well, certainly these young players have massive opportunities, starting with the Friday game against Brazil in New Jersey and then following on four days later against Mexico. It should be a very intriguing watch. Keep it here at ESPN FC. Welcome into the ESPN FC Power Rankings after another great weekend of action. Alejandro Moreno is with me to cast his eye over our editorial team's top ten picks. Last week, you were a little underwhelmed, Ali. Underwhelmed because I didn't think it was a great weekend of European football. We didn't see many good performances or many great performances. If you're going to be in the power rankings, I expect outstanding stuff from all of these players. We didn't quite have that. So we had some names that didn't quite belong. We're sort of back. Lionel Messi was excellent. Barcelona goes down to Huesca 1-0 and then Messi took over. Two goals, couple of assists. Romero Lukaku individually excellent what was, I thought, Manchester United's best performance of the season. In particular, that first half where they were dominant. Then after that, it gets a little mix and match. He goes, okay, Fabio Cogliarella scored a tremendous goal. Perhaps a can for a goal of the year early on in the season. But I don't think he was the best player in his team. De Frel was. He scored two goals away for Sampdoria against Napoli at home in what was an emotional game for Sampdoria. He should be in this list. If Cogliarella's in it for that great goal, De Frel, who scored two goals in the game, he should be in it as well. Like I said, was very good. Goretzka was dominant. Benzema, maybe he should be higher in the list. Huh? Cristiano Ronaldo's gone. Who's going to score the goals for Real Madrid? What's going to happen? Oh, my goodness. Benzema's going to score the goals. He's been good. He's been excellent for Real Madrid. And Mandzukic, we don't have Ronaldo scoring, so I guess he's got to score. All right, he belongs in the list as well. Okay, so these two are there because Cristiano Ronaldo's not doing his job anymore. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. <laughs> Tongue in cheek. Yeah. Lacazette, first start, first goal, Arsenal win away at Cardiff. Important goal for that. I important goal for him, and I just think that they're, if they're able to find that combination, that relationship between him and Aubameyang, and then you have also underneath, it, it makes Arsenal a very dangerous team going forward. And I, and I just thought him with Obama Young together, they, they had a real good understanding. There was great energy between the two of them. And the two of them played very well. I thought, like I said, was better. So, yes, he belongs in the list. And another couple of players just to round off the list. Roger Marti, a couple of goals for Levante. They mm -hmm. draw in the derby against Valencia. And Andre Duda, 100% record for her to Berlin. Mm -hmm. And Schalke fall to a second defeat. He got both goals. Okay. Don't forget about Florian Tobin. Oh, Score well. the game winner. Marseille against Monaco, away from home. So, all in all, it's a great list this week. Well, yeah, it's, you know, we're getting there. They're, they're starting to do their job downstairs. I'm, I'm, that's all I'm saying. That's all I want. 
We'll see you next time on the Power Rankings.